Um, thank you all for coming today. And thank you to those joining me on live stream. Um, Mom and Dad, hello. I know it's late in Korea, so thank you for staying up for this. Honestly, I'm floored by your support. And for those of you who are totally confused by the scale and size of what is going on, um, on Wednesday, I sent out a plea for solidarity. Um, solidarity with individuals like myself who have been asked to question ourselves, specifically our appearance for the comfort of others. The only question that this has led me to ask is how much longer we need to put up with this nonsense. As I imagine it's been for many of you, the past couple of days have been filled with a lot of confusion and total disbelief, disappointment, but most overwhelmingly, pain. Pain not just because of my own experience, but pain because of the overwhelming amount of messages that I've received over the past couple of days. Come on in. <laughs> of people like yourselves sharing your stories of being put down and being made to feel like less because of someone else's words and perceptions. And I feel your pain. For years, we've made excuses for unacceptable behavior. But I am done saying this is water because this is not a matter of you having a bad day. Now I ask us to come together today, not so that we can succumb to the level of resentment, of vengeance, and of hatred. Rather, I ask us to come together with and in compassion. Because this topic transcends all of our social identities and taps right into the heart of who we are. Because I'm more than Asian. I'm more than a woman. I am more than Letitia Chai. I am a human being. And I ask you to take this leap of faith, to take this next step, or rather this next strip <laughs> in our movement, and to join me in revealing to each other and to seeing each other for who we truly are members of the human race. Strip everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Jeb Bush, please come on. We are so triumphant, but most importantly, we are equals. And I thank you for taking this step and for taking this leap of faith. And I hope that this is only the beginning of a conversation that I did not think that we still had to have. But we do, and we are here to make it continue. So thank you. All right. I like music. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if Professor Goldstein has mentioned this, but this ties in very strongly to the topic of my thesis. And I ask, maybe you guys just all want to come in because I feel like there's a lot more room on this side. So for the past 
past four years and ever since high school, I've been very interested in refugee rehabilitation and I'm very excited to present to you today my senior thesis for the College Scholar Program. It's titled Reimagining the Host Country uh, and Refugee Relationship Using Tibetans in India as my case study. Now you're probably wondering, and I think that it's very important to explain first off why I'm interested in this topic in the first place. Um, so I'm an international student, my family lives in Korea, and I grew up moving around in Asia. This experience exposed me to some of the benefits and the challenges of cultural adaptation. Um, for instance, I think that I've gained um, the ability to empathize with people from diverse backgrounds. Um, but at the same time, I realized that there's a lot of uncertainty in having to change and having to move, and I know that that's quite scary. On a very personal note, this has made me ask the question of how we can create a sense of home <coughs> for those in unstable circumstances. And this journey has led me to a number of places. Um, one place I'd like to focus on is Myanmar. This is where I went the summer after my sophomore year. And I was going to do research on um, ethnic conflict and the prospects for reconciliation in Rakhine State, which is this area right here. Um, on the border of Bangladesh and Myanmar. If you've been following the news, you know that right now there's an ethnic cleansing, um, I would call it a genocide, um, happening in that area. And I spent lots of time with Rohingya women um, who told me about their unstable circumstances, who told me that they were constantly afraid of sexual abuse in the camps. You know, and these are women who are supposed to be citizens of a nation that have disowned them. And I was shocked and I realized the situation for refugees is far worse than we even know it to be. However, I was totally floored by the fact that there is a completely different reality, specifically in India, for Tibetan refugees, which is where I went the summer, uh, the following summer. In India, um, I was working for the Central Tibetan Go Administration, which is the government in exile, and there um, I discovered that my Tibetan friends like Kaesong and Rabjam and Yeshi, they are politicians and artists, hospitality entrepreneurs, and I wondered, how is it possible that there's such a diversity of refugees? Now, the definition of a refugee is someone who has a well-founded fear of being persecuted, on the basis of their race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion, and lacks the protection from their home country. However, within this group is a smaller community, I would say rather big, um, of protracted refugees. And these are refugees who've been living in exile for at least five years, but that's not the case. 11.6 million individuals in the world are protracted refugees. And the average time in exile for these people is 26 years, and this is not including Palestinian refugees. If we included them, the average would be at least 50 years. Now this led me into this whole exploration of how are people working on refugee rehabilitation, and after reading lots of studies and papers and UNHCR reports, um, I came across this, refugee self-reliance, which is used as kind of the gold standard of refugee rehabilitation. So what is it? Um, it's the social and economic ability of an individual, a household, or a community to meet their essential needs in a sustainable manner. And this seems kind of vague and huge, but there are measurements for this. Um, the 11 measurements are incredibly diverse. They include things like income, or employment, or education, access to shelter, water, and health facilities legal status, and community well-being. These experiences and this research led me to this understanding of refugee rehabilitation and the prospects for how we can make an innovation in this field. So I've made this matrix, um, and I believe that the, this can help us kind of understand where we want to work towards and where we are today. So there are, a variety of perspective about perspectives on refugees, but I think the two major ones that I want to focus on today are host countries and individuals who perceive refugees as a burden. So we're really familiar with this narrative. It's what Trump uses to discriminate against immigrants. Um, 
And it's this perception that refugees are people who um, just take assistance and return nothing. However, there is an alternative, which is to view refugees as a benefit, to, re to view refugees as people who are capable of reciprocating assistance, who are capable of reciprocating and contributing economically, socially, and culturally to the host country's environments. And I think that this is very highly related to refugee self-reliance. On the lower part, we see low self-reliance and high self-reliance. The way that I perceive it, Myanmar is in this lower left-hand corner where they perceive refugees as a burden. They're internally displaced people, actually. Also a class of displaced populations. And there's low self-reliance. Low self-reliance meaning that they rely on food aid and they rely on the UNHCR and on Myanmar's development initiatives. However, India, on the other hand, we see that refugees have a higher, Tibetan refugees in India have a higher level of self-reliance. And I think that is largely because India views them as able to reciprocate. So how might we reimagine this relationship between refugees and host countries? I believe that Tibetans in India are a powerful and very important example of a reciprocal relationship. Today I'd like to focus on a number of ameliorating indicators of self-reliance. And in order to move into this, um, I think it's quite important to also note that India has no overarching refugee policy. So what does this mean? It means that they haven't signed the 1951 Convention on Refugees, they have not signed the 1960 Protocol, and um, there are a number of studies that have explained this because of the government's view of the UN's policies as overly Eurocentric. Um, however, India hosts over 200,000 refugees and their population is 1.3 billion. But that's still a ginormous number and ginormous percentage of their population. To give some backstory, I think I need to explain why Tibetans are in India in the first place. Um, I don't seek to define or explain the Sino-Tibetan conflict, but I will say that in 1950, the Chinese Communist Party's People's Liberation Army staged the liberation of Tibet. Um, I think one of the major peaks was in 1959 when Tibetan guerrilla fighters staged the Lhasa Uprising, which was incredibly bloody, and it culminated with 80,000 Tibetans following the Dalai Lama into exile. Today, over 128,000 Tibetan refugees exist, and the majority of them, like 94,000 of them, live in India. Um, the other countries that host the most number of ref uh, Tibetan refugees are Bhutan and Nepal. So, Tibetans in India, how do we do this research? Um, the research that I want to present to you today, which is really the bulk of my senior thesis, is um, the first time series that I know of to ever have been done on uh, Tibetan refugee self-reliance. And I'm really excited to, to share it with you. Um, the sample size is over 100,000 individuals, and I drew the data from two demographic surveys in 1998 and 2009. The first thing I'd like to focus on are changes in economic activity. Now, if any of you have taken development economics or um, development sociology, you know that the metric for moving out of poverty is being able to identify the shift from a community in a manufacturing society, or sorry, a agricultural society to a manufacturing and service-based economy. Um, comparing the data between these 11 years, um, in 1998, 26, over 26% 26 of the Tibetan population were agricultural cultivators. Um, this means that that was their primary source of income. In 2009, only 8.1% of the population works in agriculture. The majority, 14.4%, work as in the sweater selling business, which is in total complete economic integration with the Indian community, and in the private sector, such as hospitality and travel. Moving forward, the literacy rate has shot up. It used to be 69.3%, which is pretty good, but in 2009, it shot up to 79%, and by 2020, it's projected that Tibetans in India will have a 100% literacy rate. Next, cultural preservation. 
Um, if you've learned a little bit about what the situation is like for Tibetans in Tibet, you know that cultural preservation is one of the key important kind of pillars of the Tibetan movement for autonomy. Um, many scholars have defined what's happening in Tibet as a cultural genocide, so preserving their language and religion in exile is extremely important. I'm so excited to share this metric um, because this shows proficiency in the Tibetan language. And if we thought about this kind of in a logical, rational way, we would think that the longer that you stay in exile, right, the longer that you're away from your home country, the worse your cultural fluency would get in your native language and your native religion. However, we find the opposite to be true for Tibetans in India. We find that those in the age group of 15 to 19 have a 90% fluency in Tibetan. This is higher than the Tibetans born in Tibet who came into exile. <laughs> So how can we explain the self-reliance of Tibetans in India? My argument is that when host countries provide protracted refugees with opportunities for economic autonomy and political self-governance, refugee self-reliance is more likely. So what does this mean? It means that when host countries <laughs> provide displaced populations with the services and entitlements necessary to support themselves, they are better able to not only do that, but also support their host country. And how might we explain this? Um, I'd like to draw from two theories, from economics, but also anthropology, to explain um, what reciprocity might be able to show us in the humanitarian and development world. So reciprocity and refugee rehabilitation. By this, um, I'd like to identify the three main stakeholders. Um, I believe they are the refugees of host countries and international aid organizations like the United High Commission for Refugees. Now, what does it look like? I think that when host countries, um, as my thesis statement was saying, give political autonomy and, ind and economic independence through the right to work and freedom of movement to refugees, and when aid organizations give refugees um, agency in infrastructure development by, for instance, managing their own settlements or managing their own food aid distribution. Refugees are better able to support their own needs. Moreover, refugees are empowered with what they need to give back and to reciprocate this assistance. Um, a very kind of clear example is through labor. If you give someone the right to work and they want to work and there's an opportunity, they will take it. Um, this also leads to innovation and job creation, and um, a kind of practical as an example is that um, this also creates, for instance, health facilities for local populations, because aid organizations come in and say, hey, I see you need this, but I see that you also need this. Let's make it for everybody. Um, who's managing that? The Tibetans. Um, and you might be wondering, what does this have to do with any of us? And I'd like to say that reciprocity, I believe, is an integral part of what binds social relationships. Um, so for example, let's say that Tenzin, you give Julia a free coffee, and it's out of the goodness of your heart, but really, let's be honest, we're all humans, it's because you are expecting her to do something for you later on in the future. <laughs> later on. Um, <laughs> And we participate in this type of gift exchange every day. And I think that um, from anthropology and from economics, they say that this is what creates efficiency in social exchange, is reciprocity. And you might be wondering, OK, well, Julia seems like a decent person. Um, would she give back something to Tenzin? And the fact is that 75% of people in Julia's position will do that. They will choose the mutually beneficial outcome over their own self-interest because they know that this is a repeated social exchange and they know that they need this. So how do we design reciprocity? And the two things I'd like to focus on today are collaborative policy and refugee-led infrastructure. What does collaborative policy mean? Well, think back to when I said that India has no overarching refugee policy. Just because they haven't signed all these conventions doesn't mean they haven't gone out of their way to provide very innovative and interesting policies for Tibetans, for instance. Tibetan refugees in India have legal status. They have avenues, to, as of 2014, avenues to citizenship and the right to vote. 
in terms of resettlement, they're able to manage their own camps. They have independent healthcare systems that Tibetan doctors and Indian doctors manage. Employment, they can open businesses, they can obtain business licenses and permits, they can work for the Indian government. Education, they can create their own independent system, and this looks amazing. You're blending modern education with traditional education so that you can preserve your culture, but also have the skills necessary to protect and promote it. So let's focus in on two of these things, uh, one being the government in exile. So the government in exile is called the Central Tibetan Administration, and it's a very complex organization, as you're just about to see. Um, so this is as of 2011, but just to clarify, the Dalai Lama is no longer the head of the government. It's actually a democratically elected prime minister. Um, his name is Lopsang Sange. He's a Harvard law grad, and um, he's doing some really interesting work for the government. The Tibetan government. <laughs> um, there are seven different departments, and you can see just the level of complexity and the depth of this infrastructure uh, institution. Um, one thing that I like to focus on, for instance, is the Department of Health. Uh, they offer and um, organize 38 different clinics, and they provide services to not only the Tibetan population, but also the local Indian population. This means that both communities benefit from mother and child health uh, programs for prenatal services and immunization. Um, they have a disease control program for tuber tuberculosis control and HIV, which um, affects both communities. And the impact is that the infant mortality rate, for instance, has dropped from 38.9 deaths in 1998 to a very low 15.44 deaths in 2009. One other example I'd like to focus on is, as I mentioned, cultural protection. Um, so this is a photo from the Library of Tibetan Works and Archives in Dhamsala, India, um, which is in the northern part of India. And it's really amazing because all of these, I don't know if you can see them from all the way back there, but there are all these rectangular orange and yellow <coughs> blobs. And those are actually um, individually wrapped, um, I guess, segments of the Tengir and Kangir, which are the holy scripts of Tibetan Buddhism. Because you need to protect uh, Tibetan Buddhism, what the Tibetan community has done is that when monks and nuns come into exile from Tibet, they sneak and smuggle in parts of this um, in exile, and they've recreated the entire literature in Dharmashala. Now what about the education system? Um, like I said, it's incredible. They run 83 different schools. Um, and you might be wondering, great, all the literacy rates are shooting up. This is wonderful. But isn't it because they all go to Indian schools? Well, no, it's not. 78.7% of Tibetans attend Tibetan refugee run, managed, and led schools in exile. This is amazing. So what are the opportunities for local communities in these schools, for instance? Uh, well, first off, 10% of all seats in Tibetan schools in all 83 of the schools are reserved for Indian students. Moreover, local Indians can work for and attend Tibetan schools there are many Tibetan teach, or Indian teachers who um, take charge and they lead the modern subjects and their children can attend schools. Foreign students can also attend schools. Over this past summer, um, I met a family of, from Switzerland and their kids are born and raised in India and they've all gone to Tibetan schools, which is amazing. Um, their fluency in Tibetan is better than their fluency in English. So how do we move from this wonderful example of Tibetans in India to benefit other refugees and hosts. I'd like to say that, um, first of all, it's a highly contextual issue. Um, I think that something that's really important is the level of trust between hosts and refugees. Um, and I also think that the long-term aspirations are very important. While Tibetan refugees in India and I think around the world um, have this aspiration for autonomy for Tibet. They also realize that their relationships, their long-term relationships with their host countries are incredibly valuable. Um, not to mention that uh, the movement is characterized by um, a general theme of nonviolence. Um, and I do think that that probably has an impact on the way that Tibetan refugees are received by their hosts. However, we see that there are some really interesting and successful cases 
of reciprocal symmetric relationships between host countries and refugees, one being Uganda. Now, Uganda has a large population of refugees from um, Somalia and also Rwanda. And they've done something very interesting between the years of 1999 and 2002. They've enacted what's called the Ugandan Self-Reliance Strategy. There's nothing that's been done like this before, and it's a great example. I think that they probably did it for multiple reasons, one being international legitimacy, but also because they realized that the burden on themselves, on their host country can be lifted by helping refugees uh, support themselves. So the impact that this has had is um, complete economic integration for refugees in Uganda. Now this is unprecedented and incredible. I think it's a great example that we can use to inspire um, future uh, rehabilitation initiatives. Um, another really example is what's happening in Syria. Uh, what's happening in Syria is also very interesting. But what's <laughs> happening for Syrian refugees in Jordan is even more interesting. Um, so Jordan hosts well, Jordan has the highest densities, uh, density of refugees um, compared to any other host country in the world. And the king has taken it upon himself um, to do something very special. He's created a special economic zone. Now, this was built, I believe, during the uh, Syrian civil war. And um, he realized that Syrian refugees are some of the world's most <laughs> highly skilled refugees. Um, and he said, hey, you know what? Let's have this uh, special economic zone employ only refugees. And that's what happened. And then UK AID said, hey, that's a great idea. We want to help you out. Switzerland also said that. The UN also said that. Now they have $200 million to create five more special economic zones. And in the near future, they'll be employing over 200,000 refugees. Like I said, this problem, I think, is um, systemic, but it also hits a very select number of neighboring countries, um, countries that are neighboring areas of conflict, uh, particularly harshly. So these are the top 10 countries in the world, and they host over half of the world's refugees. Now we saw what Jordan's doing, and I believe that we can use some of these examples to inspire initiatives in countries like Turkey, Pakistan, Lebanon, and Iran. And I believe that this is only possible by having a shift in perception. Because I did a case study on Tibetans in India, I really think it's only fitting that I end with a quote from the Dalai Lama. He said that friendship is crucial to solving global problems, and if the refugee crisis isn't a global problem, I don't know what is. And this type of friendship requires trust, and what does trust require but honesty and transparency? and potentially vulnerability. Most importantly, this respect, or this kind of honesty and transparency relies on the respect for other people's lives. And I believe that we can start to cultivate these values in our daily lives. For the millions of displaced, uh, displaced people trying to create a home, we can help. First, by viewing refugees as people who are not simply victims, but who are contributors. They're not only takers, but they are givers, and most importantly, they're reciprocators. Now, I thought that Tibetan refugees in India would be a great example for other refugees, but this week I've realized that they are a great example for all of us. So I urge you all to start this by viewing each other as more than simply what you look like and your circumstances. Because I believe that by viewing each other as equals, that is the only way that we will make progress in any dimension of our lives. Thank you. the beginning and I know that there's so much 
emotion, both pain, but also excitement for what this might be able to bring to our campus and other uh, places and communities. So um, I'd like to continue this conversation after all of this is over, um, after we celebrate the hard work of all of the college scholars um, today. So at 3 p.m., I'll be outside, and I hope that you guys will join me um, in starting this conversation. Um, if you're a grad student, a professor, a student, uh, whoever you are, um, you know what it's like to be human, so please join me. Excellent. Okay, questions? I'll let you run it. Yes? So I love the idea of reciprocity. It's a, it's a great way to sort of think about um, refugee status, relationship programs, integration. And I also really like the sort of theme of seeing refugees as a benefit. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you know it, I, I read a great article a few months ago about the Canadian approach to Syrian refugees, mm -hmm. which is to start from this framework of seeing them as a benefit for Canada and small local communities that sponsor and spend a year seeking to integrate the support. Is that something you know about that you think is a good model? Yeah, I think that that's really, Canada is amazing in terms of refugee rehabilitation. We can all agree on that. Um, oh, true <laughs> <laughs> And I think that that model of having uh, smaller pilots I think is really important. Um, something I should address is that doing innovative things or trying and experimenting innovative things in the humanitarian or development world is really scary because people's lives are at risk. If you want to try a new way of distributing food aid, people might die. You have no idea what's going to happen. And that's part of the reason why we have to do these types of um, pilots, but I do think that they need to be on a small scale so that in case anything goes wrong, there is um, a backup or there's some other plan. So I think that that type of initiative that Canada is doing um, is really inspiring and should be applied more, more widely. Yeah. I wonder how you think the U.S. stacks up to all of these other countries we've been talking about. I mean, you showed that diagram earlier on with your two dimensions of approaches toward talking about and of approaching refugees, and I wonder where you think the U.S. falls on that diagram. Yeah. <sighs> <laughs> um, I think that we can all agree that um, refugee policy has shifted drastically um, since November. <laughs> um, since last November. Um, and I think that America's policy does affect, um, it's, it's quite selectively applied to different populations. Like I know that for, for instance, the Tibetan refugees in India, um, the asylum process is is, it's, it's still difficult, but it's probably less difficult than if you're a Syrian or Iraqi or um, refugee. And so what I find kind of difficult to like wrap my head around, for instance, is that this is so highly contextual and culturally specific for each refugee community. So how do we do that while empowering the entire displaced population? Um, I don't have the answer to that, but I hope that uh, we can start working towards some solutions soon. Yeah. I also have a question. So, to what extent do you think that having a uh, central authority among the refugees actually helped the relationship with, with the host country? Because yes. in, in the case of Tibet, perhaps the reason why they can be so well, well organized is because Dalai Lama led them out instead of, you know, in the case of Syrian refugees. Or, <coughs> sorry, like, where they're more individual. Right. But, like, in a way, you see the Tibetan situation to be quite unique because you see a lot of other cases where when the refugee have a central authority, they became a state within the state based on the threat to the host country. You know, in the case of the Palestinian refugee in Jordan, mm. it caused a civil war. In the case of the uh, a Rwandan Hutu refugee in uh, Congo, it also caused a civil war. So mm. to what extent, so the first question is, to what extent do you think having a central authority mm. among the refugees helped the situation? And to what extent do you think that perhaps Tibet is just a unique case among all the other worst cases? Right, yeah, I, it's such a valid question. Um, and I think it's very important to point out the role of the Dalai Lama and Prime Minister Nehru in creating and designing this um, collaborative and very iterative policy. They worked multiple times on trying to figure out what types of settlements would be best for the Tibetan population, and they changed it because people were, people were dying in certain areas because of climate differences and all sorts of adaptation problems. Um, so he had, both Nehru and the Dalai Lama had um, 
very important roles in setting the tone and setting the stage for the government and exile to kind of take the lead. Um, so I do think that leadership is important. And I do think, as I said, that long-term aspirations are very important. Um, for, I think, the, the majority or the, the, a large population of Tibetans um, want to pursue Tibet's autonomy non-violently. Um, that's not to say that there is a diversity of opinions within the Tibetan community. Um, and I think that that do gives them, give them uh, the benefit of the doubt from those communities because they know that they're not trying to foment a revolution or to use India as a base to uh, go back <coughs> and to take Tibet back. We've got time for one more. Well, thanks so much, Misha, for such an informative um, presentation. I think I'm excited to see how I can relate this to like my own future. My question is, if um, I wonder if you know how the Tibetan refugees relate to like, the Indian caste system at all, and how they play a part into that, um, or if they do. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, hmm. To be quite honest, I, I don't actually know how they fit into the caste system, because I don't know enough about India's social organization um, but we I mean we do have my friends here I don't know if you guys want to speak on behalf um, Wang Mo Dechen and you guys have kind of seen what it's like um, not to put you on the spot but <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think just from personal experience um, I lived there until I was seven and I remember that we did have a servant, and I can't recall if that that individual was in the caste system. But I think that oftentimes um, Tibetans do become part of the problem in that sense, um, kind of perpetuating the caste system and the social social stigmas of that. Um, but I think, um, like Patricia mentioned, with the um, TTA and the schools that they have, I think having uh, a social awareness is becoming. Uh, more of a trend uh, among the young, younger generations. Okay, um, we will um, take a few minutes for those who want to take off to take off, or if you want to stay to hear more presentations, you're welcome to. And we will. Take off.